I'm thinking we are, since nobody else is wanting to speak up. So uh, welcome. Uh, oops, we have only nine participants, so I'm going to keep waiting. Should we let in all the participants? Zoom sure knows how to titrate people into a webinar rather than sort of releasing the hounds all at once. It's kind of one hound at a time. It's kind of like a bag of microwave popcorn where you, you wonder if it's time to turn off the microwave for the last kernel or if there's a few more to ring out before you stop. Well, some of what we begin with is throat clearing anyway, so I will get us uh, started. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jonathan Zittrain. I teach law and computer science, and with my intrepid uh, co-host, Dr. Margaret Bordeaux, um, we have been uh, convening on Zoom uh, irregularly and fitfully since uh, April or so to take stock of what's going on with the uh, global coronavirus pandemic, um, how we might assess it, how we might improve uh, our lot collectively within it, and whether there are aspects to it that despite, of course, massive public interest in it and corresponding coverage of it, we might uncover um, so that we might think a little bit more um, deeply and fulsomely about what's going on. And to that end, we're really pleased to have two guests with us today who have been thinking uh, on the big picture, uh, one of whom will have to leave uh, actually halfway through our broadcast. And uh, uh, the first, I guess we should just introduce them uh, right now, as a matter of fact. Um, the first is Jennifer uh, Pra ruger a professor of health equity, economics, and policy at the University of Pennsylvania who studies the relationship between political structure and global health outcomes and inequalities. And uh, also uh, Professor Rivka Weinberg, Professor of Philosophy at Scripps College, specializing in procreative ethics, bioethics, ethical questions surrounding birth, death, and perhaps many things in between. So um, again, thank you both uh, for joining us today. And uh, before we throw it to you, I should throw it to Margaret. Um, uh, and also alert our uh, watchers that uh, the chat room is not enabled, but the Q&A function is. So we'll keep an eye on that. And if you happen to be watching this, not through Zoom webinars, but on our corresponding uh, YouTube, and uh, I think we also, eh, maybe it's just YouTube. If you're on Facebook Live, I don't know what you're doing here. But uh, if you're also watching there, feel free to tweet at BKC Harvard, Berkman Klein Center Harvard, any questions you might have while we go. Um, and before we jump in, Margaret, maybe I should just tee up for you the question I ask every time, which is where do we stand since we last gathered? What's the slope of the curve of this thing? Um, uh, and if you had one word to open to describe how you're feeling about things, what would that word be? <laughs> Not the one word, Jonathan. I, I already told you and warned you that I feel like whenever we start with these um, things, I'm, I'm overly gloomy um, and always feel a little bit, um, I feel a little bit at sea, you know, when, when talking about it. I actually am gonna, I'm gonna do something I almost never do, which is throw it back to you. And actually our guest, <laughs> um, because I actually am very curious to know what uh, word you would use, where do you perceive us to be with respect to this epidemic? Just, I, I just wanna say the word that you would choose with respect to the epidemic um, as it just as a matter of disease control. You know, how, uh, what would be the word that you would describe? How much control do we have over the epidemic? And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll say why I'm doing this in a second, this painful exercise, but I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious <laughs> to know what your impression is. 
Well, I'll buy Jennifer and Rivka a moments of extra time to think about it and offer my own word, which I think is going to be lulled, uh, L-U-L-L-E-D, that if this were any form of narrative, by now we would have been on to the next act and there would have been narrative progress and uh, enough with all these precautions, things feel more normal just because they narratively should, while of course the virus doesn't particularly follow that convention. And that lulls us perhaps into a sense of complacency that goes very much to the apex of the American political system um, in thinking about how to handle this and something that requires sustained attention and resources mm -hmm. and uh, even medium and long-term planning, even to this day maybe still is not yet getting it. So that's, my word is lulled. Okay. I didn't mean to put my, our guests on the spot. I guess I, 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 I can also just, just stop there and return to you guys later for your word. But the, <laughs> the, the, reason, the reason that I, that I wanted to do that was because I think that that is true, that a lot of people feel, you know, everything is abnormal, but it's been so abnormal for so long. And the viral rates are, you know, they feel like that they should be, you know, lower. Uh, when in fact, you know, in, in two thirds of the country, the number of cases is increasing. Uh, in Massachusetts, the number of cases is increasing. We just had our highest uh, day of, of new cases uh, since March, um, you know, this past week. Um, so I would say in, in general, in terms of the, the sort of epidemic trend, uh, in terms of new cases, um, you know, the word I would use is, a, is accommodated. Um, to, to summarize kind of where we are. We're at, we are not in a good place. We still are having about 700 to 1,000 de deaths a day in this country. We still have a very uh, weak public health response. Um, and we uh, do not have uh, really, we haven't distributed our, our public health goods in a way that reflects any form of, of equity or of justice. Um, and uh, we are still asking people to, uh, to take on enormous, enormous risks. Um, and kids are out of school, the economic damage is, is still ongoing. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's uh, you know, again, I, I, hate, I hate the word because I'm always so bleak here at the beginning. But the, the thing that I think is charged on to the, uh, the front page and to the top of everyone's mind here is again, the national leadership uh, on uh, of this epidemic response or the lack thereof, and not even just the lack thereof, but really the, the act of undermining of, uh, of efforts to contain uh, the epidemic. And the, the issue that you know, I really wanna wrestle with all of you today about is the, the, the issue that we've sort of been like trying to keep in our peripheral vision, I feel like as a public health community. Um, and, and, and that issue is, is the malignant nature of the, of the federal leadership. It's not just ignoring the crisis or even denying the crisis. It's undermining efforts to, uh, to, to contain it um, uh, and undermining the institutions and the trust in the institutions uh, of our public institutions uh, that would give us the tools that we need to, to contain it. Um, and so this is a very vexing political moment. Um, it's certainly not something that I learned about uh, how to handle in medical school. Uh, it's really not something that uh, took center stage in my, uh, in my uh, when I was a student of public health. Um, but it was something that took center stage uh, when I worked in different countries around the world uh, experiencing um, health crises or, uh, or conflict um, and where you had to contend and think very carefully about how to contend with political leadership uh, as you were trying to implement um, a public health program. Um, and, and so I, I thought it would be really helpful, frankly, to me um, to talk with our, our two guests today uh, about this issue. Uh, you know, how should our public health leaders uh, re, uh, take into account and cope with or address uh, the political leadership of the country 
Um, and I, I think uh, both of our guests have sort of thoughts about this coming from uh, different traditions and, and different uh, frameworks. Um, but the first person I, I would uh, wanted to turn to is uh, Professor Ruger, um, who, uh, now have, have we done introductions? <laughs> properly? <laughs> okay, uh, so, so Dr. Um, Ruger is a uh, professor of health equity at University of Pennsylvania and has written a series of articles that I have found very profound about the relationship between uh, political uh, uh, configurations, um, political contexts, and, uh, and responses to health, either emergencies or health issues. Um, and uh, I, I find some of the features of these things that she has described uh, to, and some of the dynamics that she's described in uh, particularly in authoritarian countries to be uh, you know, familiar all of a sudden uh, and uh, keeping me up at night as I, I wonder if those are truly the dynamics that are playing out uh, in this country uh, with respect to handling COVID. So um, Professor Ruger, I'd just turn it over to you to say, Maybe you can describe a little bit about what you've seen in, in, in studying um, the uh, responses to health crises in authoritarian uh, countries and governments. Well, thank you, Margaret and Jonathan and Rivka and, and all the participants. Um, this is a terrific venue. I think it's a wonderful focus uh, that you all are bringing um, to the conversation. Um, I want to focus on four characteristics um, that we've been looking at um, in the Health Equity and Policy Lab as we look at the difference in responses um, to this um, uh, pandemic um, around the world and, of course, the uh, epidemic uh, in the United States. And, of course, as you were saying, um, Margaret, our work, we do couch in a justice framework. Um, and so um, we're interested in these characteristics of number one, a governing for the common good. You know, what does that look like um, when, when countries, nations are um, focused on the good for everyone? That's the first thing. The second thing is a sense of shared responsibility um, and one that's in particularly focused on scientifically grounded systems. So we have a shared sense of responsibility for a scientifically grounded approach. The third is rational and compassionate and transparent communication. And that's the really the interaction between um, government and the leadership, uh, whether it be international, national, or within a country, and the people who are in the process of trying to help combat the epidemic and pandemic um, themselves. And the fourth is ethical leadership and trust. Um, and this is a, sort of a set of characteristics that we're, we're looking at in terms of trying to understand what separates um, more effective responses from those that are less effective. And what, what are the measures of that? A uh, number of cases, but particularly death rates and mortality rates, um, and also whether or not the vulnerable, vulnerable groups or certain groups of the population are protected in ways that we would, we would expect under a system of justice and effectuating justice in health. And do you uh, find yourself revisiting anything from the paper, which for all of the factors you just enumerated explains why having a more responsive democratic, uh, I know it's a loaded word, but democratic regime is likely to lead to better outcomes. Is there anything um, counterintuitive uh, about the pandemic of 2020, when we see regimes that are anything but democratic, able to quite promptly tell people, all right, you all are quarantining here. We, we don't care what you think. And uh, we're gonna use, you know, you better have a, a, a green card uh, on your phone that lets you into the store. And if you can't show it, you're not coming. I mean, the sorts of things that only an authoritarian regime can do um, is that, how does that complicate, if at all, your four 
factors about long-term sustainable public health? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great question. Um, I would like to uh, differentiate between using authority and authoritarianism. Um, and I think it gets to your question because for sure countries are using and national governments are using their powers of authority. Um, and some would argue restricting people's liberties in ways that in this country and, and some other places people would find extremely uncomfortable uh, and problematic um, and in violation of, of these liberties. Um, however, there are countries that are using these authoritarian or author authority-like standards that have worked with their populations to, let's see, convince, I don't think is the right word, to educate, to understand collaboratively that it's in everyone's interest to, for example, in technology, have an, an app or some sort of a digitized or some sort of an electronic way of tracking this virus, who has it, who doesn't have it, um, and, and, and restricting access to certain areas of our spaces accordingly in order to save lives, um, in order to save people from illness and sickness. And so the question is how do governments do that? Um, and are they doing it effectively? And we are seeing that that's happening pretty effectively in many countries. I mean, you look at South Korea and Taiwan and even you know, countries like even European countries, um, even Asian countries south, you know, in, in like New Zealand I'm thinking of, you know, there is a great degree of restriction and the use of authority. Quarantines is another way that we use our authority. Um, but in those cases, the secret sauce is that there is a um, understanding on the part of the population that this is an, these are necessary um, efforts. There's also recognition that they may be temporary. So, you know, they may not last forever, that this is something that we might move on from after this epidemic in a country and pandemic globally. Um, subsides. And so there's a temporal aspect to it also. And I think that that's also critical as to this particular um, disease. Yeah. And, you know, what you've described is sort of the positive attributes of a country that and, the, and a governance structure that can um, cope with the health crisis. You know, I, I think your negative examples are also were, you know, very instructive to me uh, in, you know, uh, laying out some of the case studies of, of China and their experience with uh, SARS-1, um, their experience uh, with HIV and their experience with the even, you know, with the famine, uh, you know, looking at really what kind of went wrong uh, in, in those, in that political context. I wonder if you could just say a couple words about kind of what, what didn't, what were the features of the authoritarian you know, culture and government that prevented them from being able to address those, those health crises? Yeah, thanks, Margaret, for asking that um, question. Um, I'm really glad you did, because I think one thing we want, you know, look, the, we're still gathering more information, right, about the origins of this virus um, and, um, and uh, where it came from and all these things. But current state of knowledge is that it came um, from China and, and within that authoritarian regime, um, there were efforts um, made um, that were less transparent and forthcoming um, than they might otherwise have been, um, both in understanding what we all know from uh, global preparedness that one of the major sources of new viruses are, is going to be the transfer from the animal to the human population. And so this is something that is not new. We know this, we understand this. We have many, many reports in the global, governance, global health governance system. And so recognizing and employing that to one's own advantage, but also to the global community's advantage is something that is a critical part of an open and transparent dialogue 
um, that looks for solutions um, and does not try to cover up or explain or um, otherwise uh, fail to address the heart of a problem. That's number one. Number two is the slowness in the response. And this is why we're having, so we have now a global geopolitical um, problem, right? Uh, this, sort of, this sort of tension between the US and China, the backdrop to the WHO and what it did and didn't do in the entire UN system and all these things. But you know, essentially we are talking about whether or not information, right, is, is shared independently. And as you know, in one of my other articles, I've argued for a much more independent international organization. I believe we should have a global health organization that is global in the sense for all people as opposed to international for nations interests to be advanced. Um, and so this is another area where um, whether you wanna call it authoritarian or not, a characteristic of not sharing information and information not being transparent and independently verifiable is highly problematic. Um, and this is what the openness and the transparency, the impartiality and the independence gets us. And that's what we want because ultimately these are scientific problems. I believe these are scientific issues and their issues of justice. Fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, you know, one of the surprising things uh, that you wrote that struck me so um, so relevant in this sort of current moment, you know, was when you were writing about the uh, the famine in China and the Great Leap Forward, that one of this lack of transparency was really a sort of an internal issue where the government kind of fooled itself uh, because, you know, uh, folks at the local level, government officials were scared to pass on um, information to uh, the higher ups at higher political levels uh, about how badly they were doing at the local level. And so they were projecting up, you know, these, these uh, numbers uh, that they had enough food and they had enough, um, and they were producing enough. And so the higher ups then said, okay, well, we don't need to import anything and, and we uh, need to export more. You know, so, the, you know, the famine was ongoing and they were shipping food out and not taking food in. And it was a sort of internal problem of transparency, which I think was really interesting to me because, you know, as I think about what's happening now, um, I think some of those, the reluctance to give bad news uh, to higher ups um, is, is really a dynamic that, that, that we're seeing here. Um, and I, you know, I can point to a couple of examples, some of the CDC leadership when early on when they came out and said, hey, this is gonna be bad, you know, being really punished and, 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 and called out by leadership, you know, don't say that, that's, you know, unfair. Most of the lack of testing that, that we are experiencing still um, is, you know, really you can draw a line between it and uh, the fears of, um, of leadership uh, and, the, and the president in particular of not wanting more testing and continually saying, you know, don't, don't allow for more testing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, a, a question whether they've really leaned on the FDA to not approve uh, new methods of testing in a, in a timely way. Um, and I think that that's the thing that starts to really check some boxes between what you, you know, describe happening um, in, uh, you know, of course, it, you know, you focused on China, it just as it happens, um, you know, with SARS-1 and, and the famine in terms of case studies of, of what happens with the health crisis, humanitarian crisis in an authoritarian setting. Um, but, but many of those, many of those features of response you know, are eerily familiar all of a sudden. So, you know, not passing information up to the gov to uh, higher ups in the government, not giving the public uh, the information that the public needs for two reasons uh, to to both take 
on and, and start behaving in a way to protect their own selves, wearing a mask, um, et cetera. Uh, but also uh, the, the information that they need in order to sort of send a demand signal from the field saying, hey, we're struggling over here. We need more resources, um, you know, without, without really understanding where things are spreading, uh, how severe it is, um, how worried they should be. Uh, you know, it's very hard to send that demand signal. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm seeing that, um, you know, I think we are also seeing uh, that sort of any, um, uh, the, the science, as you're saying, uh, to, to uh, be able to understand and make policy and formulate a collective response that is compassionate, that is just, um, you know, that, that uh, we're seeing very specific things play out where that is being undermined. And, you know, there's been, I, I was counting up in preparation for this, three episodes where the FDA, you know, issued an emergency youth author authorization for medications that had very scant evidence behind them uh, in terms of efficacy. At, and did so, you know, at the, at the request and uh, uh, under the pressure of uh, the White House administration. Um, you know, so, so I think this starts to add up, you know, to a picture, a very, very alarming picture, quite frankly, um, you know, of, of uh, one where we are, you know, I don't know when, when you call so, uh, administration of, uh, uh, you know, a totalitarian state, I, I don't know when thresholds are, are reached, but we do see these behaviors playing out. I, I I just wonder, I mean, is, is that what you're seeing, uh, Professor Rucker? And then I'll, I'll turn to you, uh, Professor Weinberg. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. And, um, you know, as you know, I have to, to go to another panel, panel in a few minutes. So I will um, chime in here and, and, uh, and, and thank you again for including me in this conversation. Um, I think it's highly problematic um, that we are coupling science and politics uh, in the response to this epidemic in this country, and frankly, globally, internationally, uh, the pandemic in the way that has been uh, done. And it's problematic because it's a scientific problem that requires a scientific solution. Um, and that's social scientific, it's basic science. I and mean, we, we really need to try to understand how to prevent um, and uh, control and treat uh, uh, the transmission of this, this disease. I mean, it, that, that's what it's about. And we do need reliable and valid information to do that. And, and, and scientific entities need the space to do that. That is what they are authorized to do. That is what they are expected to do. Um, and they are uh, separate for a reason. And so uh, the politicization um, is highly problematic, and um, it frankly is hindering the response to the to the the pandemic and the epidemic. And in countries where you see a scientifically grounded approach with honest and and true information to the best of their knowledge at the time, um, and by the way, using prior information from other experiences, you know, country. I don't I don't believe you had to have dealt with. MERS or SARS to be have been effective. Um, you know, the US was ranked very highly in our, our global health security initiative, ranking whether their capabilities were in place for the US to have been responded uh, effectively to this. Um, and it hasn't been an optimal response. Um, and you're hitting on one of the reasons why. We need to make sure that the scientists can do their job and that we're basing our decisions on science. So thank you so much for joining us. I know you have to hop off, but to, to sort of turn to, to you, uh, Rivka. So, you know, I think we are in general agreement that some very alarming things are happening here uh, with respect to our not only not, like I said, it's not just a passive issue, um, you know, where a government's not taking it seriously and ignoring it. It's, you know, the act of undermining and the, and the act of uh, uh, undermining our, uh, our collective ability to respond. Um, and, and doing so in, in such a way where the result is, um, is death and disproportionate death uh, for um, uh, mar you know, traditionally marginalized communities in this country. Um, 
so I, I guess, you know, I read your, your op-ed back in, in January about um, mass atrocity prevention um, and what sort of our general posture as a, as a community and country should be um, with respect to, uh, to, you know, moral crimes and, and mass atrocity. I don't know whether you can sort of chime in and just tell me kind of, you know, does this reach the level of, 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 of that kind of, um, kind of event? or well not yet uh but i think that i think it's more it, it's not as uh there's a lot of problems coming from the administration about mostly about denying the facts but there's also not really a uh science does not dictate anything it just tells us the facts right it tells us what's happening it doesn't tell us what to do about it and we have not really discussed it and framed it. So one side is screaming, we have to open up where the other side is like science, science, science. That's not really a conversation. That's not really, uh, a, that's not really the topic. Science just tells you the fact. What should we do about these facts? We should be discussing what our approach to risk is. What should, uh, what is the best way to go forward, which would be, which would actually bring more people uh, on board. Because as it is, each side feels like the other side is ignoring them. Once, you know, so the Democrats are saying you're ignoring all the people who died. And the Republicans are saying you're ignoring all the people who are out of school, who are out of work, who, and so the, the facts have not been addressed. The way I would like to see this addressed is how should we manage this risk? Mm -hmm. I don't see that. So the easiest thing to do would be to have a national policy of masks. That would be nice. We don't have that. So what we have to me is like, we have the worst of all the worlds. We have an economy that, I mean, kids are out of school for a very long time. That is a very high cost that we're not really discussing that much. Um, people are out of work, people are dying. There's no public, we don't have a public health system. That's another problem. So when we talk about public health, we don't have a system. Not everyone has healthcare. Not everyone even has access to running water. Not everyone has a mask. So. Uh, when I see the approach, it's uh, extremely chaotic, extremely, and I don't, and I don't, but the approach I would like to see, what I think is, uh, makes the most sense in terms of what should we do about these facts is how should we approach this risk? What should we do to contain it? What should we do to mitigate it? Uh, that's the way I think it should be approached because that takes into account all the moving parts. Science doesn't tell you anything about what to do. It tells you what the facts are. Then you have to decide what to do. As you say, that might not be totally within science's purview because there's values and value yeah. judgments to make and balance. Um, but of course, even there, there might be a rigorous and transparent way to do that sort of thing. If <laughs> you were uh, within the US federal government right now, possibly as a public health official, and wanting to broach those topics and looking for the traditional connections between the technocratic layer and the political layer, precisely to meet those questions of what's your risk tolerance, what's our strategy here. And if you credit Margaret's account that it's been some combination of either you send that question up the pole and nothing comes back, or what does come back is an inconsistent, um, non-rigorous, uh, possibly even outright politicized in the sense of, of values that if stated openly would not be values most people would subscribe to for handling this, dot, dot, dot. Um, what, what should you do? I mean, you've written about complicity in its many forms. And if you thought it was wrong, how do you, in the public health context, balance between you resign and leave your post to whoever doesn't have your standards to take on the work, or you end up complicit with yeah. what's happening. I'm curious how you think yeah. about that. So I think that you don't lie. And one of the things that it makes it a little bit easier is that people who work for the CDC are not directly fired by the president or work for the president. And the same goes for the NIH. So there's some independence. And I think that people should first of all, always tell the truth. And so if, if there's a, if the administration says you have to change the guidelines, 
you should say, these are the guidelines that the administration dictated. So I, I don't find the, uh, there's a lot of problems, but it's not so moral quandary-ish to me because it's not like if you leave your post, somebody worse is gonna take over. First of all, that doesn't mean you shouldn't leave your post. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. But here there are people who probably will not be fired um, and they should, they should explicitly tell the truth, always tell the truth, always you know, say what the risks are, you know, you know the, the, the malaria drugs are not proven. Now they're proven not to work. Always just, you know, the vaccine is this, you know, is probably a year away, things like that. Always say the actual truth. And if you get fired, you get fired. There's a famous example, um, uh, Bernard Williams writes about this, where he talks about uh, uh, should you do something wrong to prevent somebody else from doing something worse? He gives this hypothetical case of uh, a chemist in England during World War II, or so any war would, will do. Um, and he says, this person doesn't believe in chemical warfare and they're out of work and they need a job. Should they take the job doing uh, research for chemical warfare and just not do their best? So they'll slow it down a little. I mean, they have to do the job, otherwise they're fired. But if they don't do it, somebody else will be enthusiastic and really do a great job. I don't think they should do it. I don't think you should do the bad thing so that somebody else doesn't do the worst thing. That involves predicting the future that you don't know. It allows somebody else to make you do a bad thing. And it's just in general, I think the wrong approach. I think the right approach to doing the right thing is to do the right thing, not to do the wrong thing because somebody else might do the worst thing. And I think it's the same case here. You work for the CDC, you work, even if you work in the, administra in the administration, you do the right thing. You don't do the wrong thing so that somebody else doesn't do a worse thing. And so you don't tell a half lie so that somebody else doesn't tell a whole lie. So what I see, one of the problems that has happened in the United States, I mean, like I say, the biggest problem is that the president would like to pretend this is a PR problem, doesn't seem to care much about the reality of how people suffer because of it. So that's the biggest problem. But then we also have lying throughout that has ha had a lot of bad effects for, I mean, for, for the most part, the CDC, I think, has told the truth. Fauci has told the truth. Um, but in the beginning, when they said something like, uh, don't buy a mask because it's not going to help you, obviously, that was a lie. If it's not going to help you, why is it going to help a doctor? Of course, that wasn't true. That was a big mistake. Because then when they came back around and said, hey, everybody wear a mask, people were like, well, in the beginning, you said not to wear a mask. And your hypothesis there is not that they the science was uncertain and then it settled. It was that they felt that if they told people masks worked, there'd be a mask shortage for the people who needed them most. So they told a fib in order not to have a run on masks. Is that, yeah, is that a lie rather than a mistruth, uh, just a mistake? Yes, yeah. just because, and Fa I, Fauci admitted as much actually. He said, we didn't want to run on masks. The science wasn't unclear. If it was unclear, why would the doctors be wearing masks? <laughs> of course they were protective. Um, how protective they were was not known, but that was a very that was an example, I think, of a a lie. It's not a fib; it's flat out false, intended to deceive. So it was a lie told for a good purpose. That is a bad idea. I, I don't think. That was a fib. <laughs> but I guess maybe it's the scale of the lie that makes it a fib. <laughs> the lie, no, uh, uh, it's a it's an it's a full it's an intentionally false thing done to deceive people, even for a good reason. That is not the way to be moral. And it usually doesn't work out. Look how it backfired here. And then, uh, but, but that would, uh, that's from what I see about, let's say Fauci or the yeah. NIH, most of the time they've been pretty honest. That was a mistake in the beginning, but it has backfired quite spectacularly now in terms of not, uh, of how many people don't want to wear a mask when if everybody wore a mask, so many more activities could be allowed. So I've got to ask you in the spirit of Bernard Williams, there's been some intimation that the information flow to the president has been modulated in yeah. order to produce certain decisions or results for, quote, the greater good. Yeah. Uh, how would you relate that to the chemical warfare making facility? Is that something that you owe the truth to the public? Do you owe the truth to the principal if you think that the principal yeah, yeah. will do something put bad with it? That's much more complicated because part of the truth is this social contract and the trust. You trust the person to do something good with the truth. You know, truth is important for trust. When you have somebody who has the, the wrong intentions in the presidency, which is what I think 
we have. I don't think, I think the president does not care that much about most people. Um, and so the contract is broken and I don't know that he is owed the truth. So then you have more of a pragmatic question of, is it better to lie to the president? I don't know that that's true either. I don't think that- But gosh, I mean, it really does implicate everything you were saying before because it's having to predict the future and all the contingencies well, and it, what's it, the it, greater it, good and all of that while basically making yourself the deep state. No, I, I think that the difference here is, is the lie wrong in the first place? When somebody is untruthful all the time, then your bond, your obligation of truth to them is weakened morally because they're sort of out of the contract and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. But I and also- And you shouldn't inform them that they're out of the contract because if you do, then obviously- well, they're I, mean, I don't think lying to the president is a good idea either. <laughs> right. I don't think so. I don't think it's gonna help anything. I think everybody should flat out tell the truth. I think Deborah Burke standing nearby complicitly not saying anything is a mistake. And if she would get fired, she should get fired. I think she's doing the wrong thing. So to go back to your original question, whether you can lie to a liar is more morally complicated um, than, or whether you can lie to a murderer is more morally complicated than whether you should generally lie. You shouldn't lie. But in this case, it is not more complicated because I don't think lying to Trump is the good idea either. Lying to the president is also not a good idea. It's it's very rarely a good idea, even practically to lie, and morally almost never. So um, I think we're in a you know, very problematic public health situation and political situation, but I think some of the moral problems are not that hard to solve. Should you lie? No. <laughs> I suppose too. Uh, uh, so, well, I was just gonna say, you know, I, so <laughs> I, um, well, I don't know, this is a little risk on my part, I guess, but I, uh, what, what you're saying in some ways really chimes with some of the research that I've been trying to now frantically look up about um, the personality disorders, <laughs> actually, and treatment of personality disorders. And, you know, there's been a, there's been a very robust, you know, conversation I think many of us have heard about uh, amongst the psychiatric community, um, you know, the folks that do uh, work with people with personality disorders and violence, uh, people with very violent behavior, you know, have been like, oh, this is a very dangerous situation. We think, you know, the, the president has a personality disorder. Um, and, you know, folks coming back being like, oh, you shouldn't diagnose the president. You know, that's not your place. Think about the ramifications of that, uh, you know, which I think is, which I have a lot of time for as well. But one of the things that was interesting uh, in the sort of research around therapy for personality disorders, um, especially a, a sort of narcissistic uh, or and, and violent, personality disorders is, it's also the rule of thumb you learn on your first day on the psychiatric wards in medical school. Never play to somebody's delusion. If somebody is, has a delusional disorder, which is different than a personality disorder, but but in both cases, don't play to, into the delusion. Don't pretend that you are, you know, say, okay, this person has a delusion that they're a um, the CIA is after them. Don't, you know, do something like say, oh, I'm part of the CIA and we're not after you. You know, so, something, you know, kind of crazy. Don't do that because it really will, you know, reinforce the delusion. And in the case of personality disorders, the technique is really called limit setting, uh, where you, where you, um, you know, essentially fence them off. Anytime they say, you know, a lie or something that's a half truth or imply something, you know, you, you immediately, you know, step forward to, to say, no, that's untrue you know, and, and just, you know, very much fencing them in as a therapeutic measure. Um, and so it's interesting that you say that because it came to mind when I was watching some of these press conferences as, you know, Trump is getting off the helicopter, taking off his mask and, you know, going into the White House, exposing people to millions of viral particles, potentially, you know, that, that for me, that is the, those are the cases and those are the moments that I think public health people and leaders need to train on you know, how to intervene in that moment, how to, how to intervene when you're standing behind the president and they're saying something untruthful and very harmful. Um, and I, I think that's a, that's a very tough, that's a very tough kind of um, thing to figure out, to play out, you know, uh, we're so, I, I don't know. Anyway, so it chimes with what you're saying, I've never lie. <laughs> um, I think it's it's uh, morally difficult. I think it can that's be right. It can be personally difficult because it takes some kind of courage. Yes. Um, it doesn't take the highest degree of courage. Nobody's going to kill you. You know, you're not going to be tortured. We're not in that kind of a regime. So it just takes a certain kind of personal courage to 
uh, uh, tell the truth. Um, but it is not morally complicated. But I, I'm still following Margaret's uh, don't feed the delusion. If you have a boss who seems to only care, for example, about the red states, would pointing out that a particular strategy that happens to be good for everybody, pointing out, oh, this is really good for the red states. This is going to help you with your whatever it is that isn't really in if you are the advisor, you might not think that's a noble motive. Is it OK to play to that? Yes, because that's true. <laughs> And there's uh -huh. nothing wrong with saying that. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging that. But I also think that there is more than one level of problems here because we have a problem at the federal level, and that is the biggest problem, where we don't have a mask mandate, where we have a complete, we have no policy, which is complete chaos and has let the pandemic get to this point, where there's a lot of wishful thinking. But we also don't have state policies that are going to engender cooperation amongst the population. Because when you tell people, like we told them in the beginning, Flat, stay home and flatten the curve. So people did that and they still couldn't go back to work. Don't overwhelm the hospitals. So we didn't, and they still can't go back to school. You have places where I, I live in California where they're talking now still opening bars where you can't wear a mask or people are drunk, which is the best way to spread the disease before they're talking about opening the schools for children. So you're not gonna get co -op. It's not, you can't get people to cooperate when your policies don't make sense. That's why they're not cooperating. Absolutely. And there's, there are multiple layers of, of, and of which Jonathan has <laughs> suffered through my ranting about in this very forum. <laughs> From lack of a national strategy to malignant leadership to a very uh, poorly functioning public health system, very poorly funded, to really, uh, I, th I agree that the, the, the um, the loss of the plot, if you will, over what is our goal uh, in terms of this this uh, this point in the epidemic, right? Flatten the curve actually worked because people, you know, had a very clear goal. They could see that curve, you know, over the weeks flatten. Um, and, and I think that you know there is a controversy in in the public health community. What is the goal that we should strive for now? Um, should it be, you know, elimination? Um, and people say, no, that's too aggressive and the knock-on consequences are hard. So I, I think the, 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 the issue around what you ask people, but what, one thing I would sort of push back on a little bit is around this issue of cooperation because, because the truth is the American public has cooperated dramatically. I mean, many, many like I, I think the last count was 75% of the public wears a mask. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, it, it's it's actually been sort of shocking to me uh, that um, you know how much uh, folks have have dug in and really taken on uh, following the advice as they the, as they understand it. There's a tremendous amount of of uh, churn and you know things in the headlines, et cetera. Even things like contact tracing and not calling people back from contact. That's just not what we're seeing in Massachusetts. I mean, we see people pick up the phone for contact tracers by and large, um, overwhelmingly so. So, so, so I think that we do have a lot of public trust. I think that, uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think that the question I would sort of wrestle with here is this issue around how do we deal with, you know, given that, given that we have all of these other problems, you know, how, what are there techniques that we can use right now to to bring people together around a common set of goals and a common set of facts. Um, and I'm not think, sure how to orchestrate that. I think you could if you, if there was a little, I don't see clarity. I see that, you know, the national strategy is certainly, sorry, I don't know how to get this to stop. Hang on. Um, the national strategy is not a strategy and is full of mistruths and is awful and has created a lot of problems. But the state strategies are also problematic. Again, what is the goal? When you told people to flatten the curve, they could, they could, people agreed with it, participated and succeeded and they got no reward for it. <laughs> there was not, you know, nothing, nothing. You now, yes, the hospitals were not overwhelmed. That, <laughs> that is a reward, that is a reward. But everyday life has been crushed. Um, and so what I see is, I. I want to hear more about risk. I want people to talk more about what are we doing for young people? We've asked so much of them. So many, there's no co colleges are wreck, internships are gone, jobs are gone, 
their student loans are still there, young kids, their lives are being, you know, their whole development is being warped. And we keep saying to them, do this for your grandmother. That's not how people work. What are we giving back to them? Where's the social contract? Where's the GI bill for all the young people who are supposed to hide now when their risk is very low? Yeah, uh, well, I, I definitely think that the re not reopening schools is, you know, a enormous, enormous, enormous issue as I'm sitting here with my four kids banging at the door. And I do have a lot of, um, I would say that the way I would kind of characterize the problem is we have lost our ability to prioritize as a community. Um, and there's not really that sense of conversation around really what are our priorities based on shared values. And that's the conversation that I wish uh, was yeah. being led. I think it could be led at the state level, potentially. Yeah. I don't know that it is. Um, but I think it's also because the state is just states are struggling uh, with uh, trying to negotiate and contend with uh, the national leadership and whether the national resources are going to be available to them. So, you know, when you come to testing issues, for example, you know, we, we, would, we would probably reprioritize who should be tested and who should have access to testing. The state doesn't want to get involved in that necessarily because uh, they're not sure the testing resources are going to be there for them to actually act on the priorities that people make, is my sense. I don't know. I blame the states a little more than you do. Uh, of course, the national, I blame, blame everybody. Um, the, 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 the national strategy doesn't exist and is, and is contrary to fact and is malevolent, actually. Doesn't care about people. But the states haven't done what you said. They haven't said, this is what we value. Here's how we're going to aim at what we value. Here's how we're going to prioritize what we value. Here's how we're going to manage this risk. There's been no coherent strategies. It's better to have one at the federal level, but it doesn't excuse that there isn't one at the state level either. So uh, with the particular example in mind, just from recent headlines around the apparent White House rejection of the FDA's guidelines for vaccine approval, uh, the story goes with the hope of being able to announce approval of one prior to the election to affect the incumbent's electoral fortunes. I'm wondering how your template of ideally we'd have self-interest all around still produces a mutuality in a pan pandemic, but speak to self-interest. Would it be incumbent say on a pharmaceutical company in a fit of public spiritedness not to put up a vaccine for distribution and possibly massive windfall profits to themselves and their shareholders um, or is it like, hey, it's the government's job to set the rules of the game. And if the ultimate rules are submit your vaccine and we'll stamp it yes, uh, Pfizer is kind of obligated to, or at least allowed to, to pursue that. No, they're not because the moral rules are always the rules. So those are the rules of the game. Morality is the rule of the game. So morality sets the rules. Can you set, can you release a vaccine that is not to the American standard just because you have an incompetent and uncaring president that lets you? Of course you can't. What do you mean the rules of the game? The rules of the game are the moral rules. Those are the rules. So no. I, again, what we have here is not, I don't find them, we have a lot of problems here about people not complying with morality and also people being massively incompetent and impractical at all levels. But I don't find this so moral dilemma-ish. It's not like, oh, what should we do? Should we law? I, no, you shouldn't. Should you release a vaccine when it's not ready? Of course not. Just because somebody lets you? When is that an excuse? But I mean, it's kind of along the lines of, I paid exactly to the penny the tax I owed and no more even though in a just world, I would be paying more taxes kind of thing. Now, maybe this I has- I don't, I, don't agree with that. I don't agree with that analogy because uh -huh. paying your taxes, your moral obligation is to pay what you owe. <laughs> Releasing the vaccine, your moral ob obligation is to only release it when it has met the standards it's supposed to meet. So it hasn't the met the standards. standards exist but... independent of what the government sets as the standards. The standard, yes, the standard is the moral standard and certainly not a standard that was altered for reasons that have nothing to do with the stand for the for why the standards are what they are. Mm -hmm. Taxes okay. are much different because taxes are, you know, much more political agreements. So you can agree to one thing, you agree to something else. 
a standard of safety for a vaccine is not supposed to be a political agreement. And at that point, then it's not a self-interest story. It really is a story of being regarding of others and the community, at possibly at some sacrifice or foregone opportunity for oneself. Yeah, the same way you're not supposed to steal from people or sell them things that don't work. Uh, and so let's say the government says today you can do price gouging or, you know, today you can sell poison. It's still wrong to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because okay. the game are the moral rules. The government doesn't set moral rules. They only set political rules. That's different. Mm -hmm. Do you have any time for, you know, or patience with the head of the FDA doing, you know, because I, I can kind of imagine, right, the conversation in his head. This is uh, Secretary Hahn, who's like, okay, you know, the, the government says, uh, you know, Trump says, hey, you know, uh, we think plasma, this thing of, you know, uh, of uh, convalescent plasma is going to be really good for people. And there's like a glimmer of evidence that maybe could be useful. It's been useful in other things. It's really not unusual to try. <laughs> um, and, you know, he, he ends up authorizing, you know, a, a the use of issuing an EUA, emergency youth authorization for convalescent plasma, um, has a big press conference with Trump, you know, saying, this is awesome. We are making huge strides, posts the evidence that he used to, um, to prove that, which was a subgroup of a subgroup of a subgroup analysis, um, you know, definitely weak tea in terms of what we would usually use as evidence for um, issuing an EUA, uh, and puts it on the website, that analysis, and says under the heading, I wrote it down, another achievement in administration's fight against pandemic on the FDA website. So. Yeah, that's well, not like this. Okay. Well, okay. I mean, you know, with uh, with uh, convalescent plasma, it did turn out that the effect wasn't very big, and you know, we're still kind of studying it. Maybe, maybe. You know, with other things like um, uh, remdesivir, you know, does look like it has a, a place. You know, later they they also did the same kind of thing. Um, you know, how much of that is kind of going along to get along? How much of that is? Um, you know, is, is so, I mean, I think I, if I have said anything, it's that don't go along to get along. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. Never do it. Never, never do. do right. Never do a slightly bad thing because you think it's going to lead to a greater good. That is, that is, you know, there's two ways. Well, there's a few ways, but there's more than two ways. But one of the two central moral theories are sort of principle based or outcomes based. I go for principle-based because you never know what the outcome is. And when you let the ends justify the means, you do a lot of terrible things and you don't know what the ends are. So I say, you go for the means. That's sort of the Kantian approach, the principle-based approach. You do the right thing. And what happens happens because it's always what happens happens. So at least you'll know I did the I right thing. I call that the, the Jim Comey approach. I don't agree that it was Jim Comey's <laughs> approach. I think Jim <laughs> Comey had a lot of, because he did not, um, he, there were rules in place that are not just the rules of the game, but that were morally true as well, not to affect an election, which he did. I think he was self-aggrandizing, he fooled himself, and he presented it as I'm doing the right thing. But I don't think that was accurate in his case. But mm -hmm. if it was, then he would not have been doing the wrong thing. But I think he, I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are more there, there will be cases where things look terrible no matter what you do, or you do something and it leads to a terrible result. And that's really unfortunate. But in these kinds of cases, I really think, and I think for the most part, the medical community has done a pretty good job this, of pushing back against the lies. All the leaks you get out of the CDC, who's leaking that stuff? All the leaks you get out of the NIH about this is against the rules and this bypass this process. Somebody doing the right moral thing is leaking that to the press. It would be even more right if they put their name in front of it and their face too. Mm -hmm. We have maybe a minute left. Anything we've missed that you'd wanna to bring to the table on this range of topics? Uh, I don't think we've missed anything. Um, I would go back to the beginning where you asked if there's one word that I feel about the pandemic in the United States, I'm gonna say two, which is over it. People feel over it. I see this, uh, I live in a neighborhood where there's um, a lot of very right-wing people and a lot of very left-wing people. And I see a lot of agreement of like exhaustion. We keep doing what we're supposed to do and nothing's getting better. We keep, you know, uh, um, you know the, the kids are home, they're socially isolated. 
they're they're suffering a lot. You know, I have a, a it, kids too, and I, I really see it's really terrible. Uh, there's nothing you can do as a parent to really mitigate the effects of not being around other children, which is a normal human development. Uh, and so, and we don't see the vaccine. We don't see things getting back to normal. People are unemployed, you know, and we don't see reasoned policies. We see, they keep talking about restaurants and bars, which should be the last thing on the list instead of schools, which should be the first thing on the list. And I think people are exhausted be because we have been ineffective. Our policies have been ineffective. Well, it calls to mind uh, something, uh, I think it was Julia Yaffe uh, tweeted the other day, an old Russian kind of proverb that says, well, it feels like things are really bad, but in fact, they're average because this year is better than last year and next year, sorry, this year is worse than last year and next year will be worse than this year. So we're really in the middle. Yes. Or as my father liked to say, you ask a guy with his head in the freezer and his feet in the fire, how are you? And he says, on average, I'm doing okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Well it could be a lot worse, but we can also, it could be a lot better. And it could be a lot better starting tomorrow. None of these policies are set in stone. They could all be, we could get better at this every day. But I don't Absolutely. see it happening. You're right. Well, what's I, I, I don't see it happening at the state level either. I don't see it happening at any level of government. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think we're in violent agreement there. Um, and I would say that, um, but I do want to note, I, I always start on a note of pessimism, but I try to end on a note of optimism, usually after I get the the uh, 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 the expression from Jay-Z, and I'm going to do that again, which is that, yes, you're right, that actually public health works, okay? If we do the three things, that we do them well, the contact tracing, the mask wearing, and the environmental modification, the ventilation, and air purification, we actually can control this, and we can get kids back in school, and these things are possible. And, uh, and it, so it, I think part of the over it frustration is that we're just not getting on, on it. We're not I doing think, the work that I needs to get done. So I don't think that's the whole thing though. I think part of the frustration is when we make progress, we don't open up the things that are most consistent yeah. with our shared values. Yes, so no, I agree with you. Um, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and I, you know, I think that we are, you know, it's like been pushing a huge boulder up an enormous mountain and you strain and strain and strain and you don't seem to get anywhere. Um, and, and I think that's a huge problem. But I do think that that is also a, a, you know, a situation by choice. And I do think that things will change um, for the worse or for the better. We'll see. I'm, I'm optimistic. It'll be for the better. <laughs> Well, uh, especially against, uh, I guess it's hard not to just call it the sophistry of, uh, there were some folks on television saying that the fact that the president caught it shows you that none of these measures work. So we might as well just, It you know, shows you the opposite. He is right. perfect. Exactly. But um, you point I out that there- that it shows you the opposite. The, pub yeah. the public reaction has been overwhelmingly, you, you, you know, yes for it. So there is a, uh, a path forward. There is a way to get it right. Maybe we'll be in the Churchillian zone of we'll follow that path after we try all the others. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll keep cycling through. But uh, Rivka, thank you so much for joining us and for your clarity and determination and all of your work that's gone into trying to keep people focused on uh, their ethical valence and their responsibilities and uh, the courage maybe that's called for at tough moments to, um, to be true to it. Uh, so thank, thank you very you. much. I really appreciate that you, you know, you're having me here. And I think these, ki you know, the, this, these kinds of um, uh, events are really, and discussions are really important. Um, and it would be really good if more people would talk about the problem in this way. Well, on that optimistic spirit and hopeful spirit, uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you all uh, for tuning in and uh, we will catch you uh, uh, in a future session, check in on how things are going. Uh, and uh, over to you, Margaret, for any final benediction. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, I think the path is, the path it may be hard, but it is clear. So let's get on it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, and this wraps uh, yet another COVID state of play. We'll catch you uh, again uh, in a matter of a few weeks where, uh, as Margaret's put it so artfully, like the end of a Newsweek article, 
Uh, the future is uncertain, but one thing is clear. If things don't get better, they could certainly get a lot worse. Until then. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>